Serial killer Rodney James Alcala murdered at least nine women and girls across the United States. He spent time in prison for sexual assault and other crimes in the 1970s but continued to rape and kill when he was free. Autopsies of some Alcala victims revealed that he would strangle women, then wait for them to regain consciousness before the final kill. Alcala also sometimes arranged the corpses of women he'd murdered in poses. But before we get to the main story, kindly remember to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you will be notified anytime we upload an amazing video. Alcala was born as Rodrigo Jacques Alcala Buca in San Antonio, Texas, on August 23, 1943. He moved to Mexico with his family when he was around eight years old and his father abandoned the family while they were in Mexico. Alcala, his siblings, and his mother later relocated to Los Angeles. He attended California State University, then transferred to UCLA. He graduated with a fine arts degree in 1968. After fleeing California that year, Alcala used his John Berger alias to enroll in New York University, where he took a class with Roman Polanski. After fleeing the scene of his 1968 attack on eight-year-old Taylor Shapiro, Alcala traveled to the East Coast. In 1971 he was included on the FBI's most wanted list. Some girls at an arts camp in New Hampshire recognized their counselor, who was using the name, John Berger, from this list. They told the camp's dean and Alcala was soon arrested, though he was able to plead to the lesser charge of child molestation and served just 34 months. Though he was a registered sex offender, Alcala managed to land a job with the Los Angeles Times as a typesetter in September 1977. His past conviction for sexual assault prompted California police to interview Alcala in March 1978 as a potential suspect in the Hillside Strangler killings, another set of serial murders that occurred in California in the 1970s. Alcala was cleared of those crimes, and police did not realize they had spoken with a different serial killer. In September 1978, Alcala appeared as Bachelor No. 1 on The Dating Game, a TV show that had men and women cheekily interview prospective dates, sight unseen. At the time he was a convicted child molester, but the show did not run a background check. Alcala was introduced as a successful photographer, who got his start when his father found him in the darkroom at the age of 13, fully developed. Good luck, gentlemen. Well, let's see. Bachelor number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. <laughs> Between takes, he might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. A fellow Bachelor contestant later described Alcala as a very strange guy with bizarre opinions. Alcala won the competition and a date with the episode's bachelorette, Cheryl Bradshaw, who subsequently refused to go out with him because she found him creepy. Criminal profiler Pat Brown, noting that Alcala killed at least three women after his dating game appearance, speculated that this rejection might have been an exacerbating factor. Robin Samso, a 12-year-old girl from Huntington Beach, disappeared somewhere between the beach and her ballet class on June 20, 1979. Her decomposing body was found 12 days later in the Los Angeles foothills. Samso's friends told police that a stranger had approached them on the beach, asking to take their pictures. Detectives circulated a sketch of the photographer, and Alcala's parole officer recognized him. During a search of Alcala's mother's house in Monterey Park, police found a rental receipt for a storage locker in Seattle. In the locker, they found Samso's earrings. Alcala was arrested in July 1979 and held without bail. In 1980 he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for Samso's murder, but the verdict was overturned by the California Supreme Court because jurors had been improperly informed of his prior sex crimes. 
In 1986, after a second trial virtually identical to the first except for the omission of the prior criminal record testimony, he was again convicted and sentenced to death. In 2001 a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals panel nullified the second conviction, in part because a witness was not allowed to support Alcala's contention that the park ranger who found Samso's body had been hypnotized by police investigators. While preparing their third prosecution in 2003, in Orange County, California investigators learned that Alcala's DNA, sampled under new state law, over his objections, matched semen left at the rape murder scenes of two women in Los Angeles. Additional evidence, including another cold case DNA match in 2004, led to Alcala's indictment for the murders of four additional women, Jill Barkham, 18, Georgia Wixted, 27, bludgeoned in her Malibu apartment in 1977, Charlotte Lamb, 31, raped, strangled, and left in the laundry room of an El Segundo apartment complex in 1978, and Jill Parento, 21, killed in her Burbank apartment in 1979. All of the bodies were found posed in carefully chosen positions. Another pair of earrings found in Alcala's Seattle storage locker had residue that matched Lamb's DNA. During his incarceration between the second and third trials, Alcala wrote and self-published a book, Youth, the Jury, in which he claimed innocence in the Samso case and suggested a different suspect. He also filed two lawsuits against the California penal system, for a slip and fall incident and for refusing to provide him with a low-fat diet. For the third trial, Alcala elected to act as his own attorney. He took the stand in his defense, and for five hours played the roles of both interrogator and witness, asking himself questions, addressing himself as Mr. Alcala in a deeper than normal voice, and then answering them. During this self-questioning and answering session, he told jurors, often in a rambling monotone, that he was at Knott's Berry Farm applying for a job as a photographer at the time Samso was kidnapped. He showed the jury a portion of his 1978 appearance on the dating game in an attempt to prove that the earrings found in his Seattle locker were his, not Samso's. Jed Mills, the actor who competed against Alcala on the show, told a reporter that earrings were not yet a socially acceptable accoutrement for men in 1978. Alcala made no significant attempt to dispute the four added charges, other than to assert that he could not remember killing any of the women. 10. As part of his closing argument, he played the Arlo Guthrie song Alice's Restaurant in which the protagonist tells a psychiatrist that he wants to kill. After less than two days' deliberation, the jury convicted him on all five counts of first-degree murder. A surprise witness during the penalty phase of the trial was Taylor Shapiro, Alcala's first known victim. Richard Rappaport, a psychiatrist paid by Alcala and the only defense witness, testified that borderline personality disorder could explain Alcala's claims that he had no memory of committing the murders. The prosecutor argued that Alcala was a sexual predator who knew what he was doing was wrong and didn't care. In March 2010, Alcala was sentenced to death for the third time. After his 2010 conviction, New York authorities announced that they would no longer pursue Alcala because of his status as a convictor awaiting execution. Nevertheless, in January 2011, a Manhattan grand jury indicted him for the murders of Cornelia Crilly, the TWA flight attendant, and Ellen Hover, the Ciro's heiress, in 1971 and 1977, respectively. In June 2012, he was extradited to New York, where he initially entered not guilty pleas on both counts. In December 2012, he changed both pleas to guilty, citing a desire to return to California to pursue appeals of his death penalty conviction. On January 7, 2013, a Manhattan judge sentenced Alcala to an additional 25 years to life. The death penalty has not been an option in New York State since 2007. In 2010, Seattle police named Alcala as a person of interest in the unsolved murders of Antoinette Whittaker, 13, in July 1977, and Joyce Gaunt, 17, in February 1978. Alcala rented the Seattle area storage locker in which investigators later found jewelry belonging to two of his California victims in 1979. 
Other cold cases were reportedly targeted for reinvestigation in California, New York, New Hampshire, and Arizona. In March 2011, investigators in Murray County, California, north of San Francisco, announced that they were confident that Alcala was responsible for the 1977 murder of 19-year-old Pamela Jean Lamson, who disappeared after making a trip to Fisherman's Wharf to meet a man who had offered to photograph her. Her battered, naked body was subsequently found in Murray County near a hiking trail. With no fingerprints or usable DNA, charges were never filed, but police claimed that there was sufficient evidence to convince them that Alcala committed the crime. In September 2016, Alcala was charged with the murder of 28-year-old Christine Ruth Thornton, who disappeared in 1977. In 2013, a relative recognized her as the subject of one of Alcala's photos made public by Huntington Beach PD and NYPD. Her body was found in Sweetwater County, Wyoming, in 1982, but was not identified until 2015 when DNA supplied by Thornton's relatives matched tissue samples from her remains. Alcala admitted to taking the photo, but not to killing the woman, who was approximately six months pregnant at the time of her death. Thornton is the first alleged murder victim linked to the Alcala photos made public in 2010. The 73-year-old Alcala was reportedly too ill to make the journey from California to Wyoming to stand trial on the new charges. Alcala died of unspecified natural causes in Corcoran, California on July 24, 2021, at the age of 77. That brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks for watching.